Colorado Business Roundtable presents the first annual Collaboration in Industry Awards. Featuring great speakers and Colorado's best collaborators in business. With a business roundtable update from Jackie Hinman, CEO of CH2M. Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper. With keynote address from Gallup CEO Jim Clifton. Good afternoon. My name is Scott LeBan. I'm the president of Colorado Succeeds. I have the great honor of introducing Jim Clifton today. Though I must say that um, if he is the main course and if the governor is the appetizer, that without a fancy suit or an ability to play a song, I'm feeling much like the little crumb that's been sort of brushed off your plate onto the tablecloth right there. Um, I, in the last 10 minutes, I've been trying to come up with one, but I'm sorry, it's just not one of my strengths. So uh, we'll have to work on that. Um, it's really, truly an honor to have the opportunity to hear from you today. Your work has just really impressed upon our work at Carter Succeeds in many important ways. We've been aspiring to create a vision for the future of our state for education and workforce. And the work of Gallup has really pushed us in many ways to sort of redefine what success looks like. And we really use that well-being index to now consider what success looks like for students in a broader point of view and, and really what is the purpose of education. And so um, I, I know that I'm not alone in this. I know that many other people in the room have been influenced by Gallup's work. And, uh, and certainly, I just would love a show of hands. How many of you have heard of or have used the Strengths Finder assessment? How about anyone pay attention to uh, one of the Gallup world polls? <laughs> Seen some of that. And, and how about Jim's publications on global leadership, or, or perhaps the book in front of you right now, The Coming Jobs War? So, so clearly, this is an exciting opportunity for you as well. Uh, Jim's long been recognized for helping leaders and organizations solve their most pressing problems. And according to Jim, we can change the world one client at a time through extraordinary analytics and advice on everything important facing humankind. I just have to say, that's a hell of a scope. And uh, I'm really excited to learn a little bit more about what that's going to look like. So uh, if I tried to list all of his awards, this lunch would quickly turn into a dinner. So without further ado, I'd like to just welcome to the stage the chairman and CEO of Gallup, Jim Clifton. Well, thank you. I, uh, I've done something kind of dangerous. I, I've, I've been to Colorado so many times. Sean's had, is he still here? I don't know. He's had me here so many times, I could almost call all of you by name. And uh, one of the things they teach you is don't change your speeches, change your audiences. I've got a problem because I think I know I, I, with, with this. But I, um, good thing, though, is we've, we've, got, we've got a bunch of new research, and I, I'm going try, to try this stuff out on you. I, I haven't really dealt with this material before. I just want to tell you that because if there are times where it looks like I'm lost or don't know what I'm talking about, that's exactly what's happening to me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I love coming to things like this. Have you noticed that there's uh, th that three of the last probably five Nobel Prizes is for behavioral economics? That was kind of the squishy thing that economists don't like. Economists have a basic premise that we're rational, that man, that's, it, probably, it probably says humans now, but that basically everything we do can go back to something rational. If you want to make it real simple, it's just money. We take lowest price. Do you see what I mean? But these guys are getting Nobel Prizes because what they figured out is that when we make a decision in life, we make about 10,000 big ones and little ones every day. Only about 30% is rational. 70% is irrational. That just kind of blows me away. Well, whoever, I don't know who said that, but one of the biggest decisions I made in my life was who I married. Now, you'd think you'd do a bunch of calculations on that, wouldn't you? I was walking down the, the hallway in O'Hare. I mean, think about that. I just saw a woman, and for some reason it clicked in my head, I should marry her. <laughs> like three seconds. And I did. That was, 30, that was a long time ago, over 35, 35 years ago. But see, there's nothing rational in that at all. But it's true with our whole lives. But I think as leaders, it's so great that you guys get together and, and, and work on, on your future. But most of our systems are still built in that old legacy assumption about behavior and that we're rational. 
are, is this working? All the low-hanging fruits out in that emotional part, and we're not very good at it. I, I like Denver. You know, the United States of America, I'm going to just look at my watch here. You know, everybody talked too long. I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching outside. I was wondering if it was going to start getting dark. I thought maybe that would get him, <laughs> maybe that'd get him to slow down a little bit. <clears throat> but the, the spirit of America isn't quite what we, it, it, it's not good enough right now. So you say, is that the national spirit? No, cities have spirits, and that's where you get, there's some engineers in here. You know, when you're looking to fix something, you look for variation. So we don't really have one performance in America. We don't have one GDP, we do, but the variation of cities is spectacular. We don't have one spirit either. I'll just name some towns for you. Um, well, so I, I started a company in Lincoln, Nebraska, must have been 40 years ago, but I'd go make my sales calls. I was selling market research and polls and that kind of thing. But there was one city I would go to that I couldn't wait to get there because it had more spirit than any city in the world. It also had the highest um, per capita GDP of any city in the world. For a guy from Lincoln, I'd never seen so many new cars, big fins and and. and Cadillacs and Corvette. I'd never seen anything like it. Then I go to lunch. I didn't even know about cafes and bars. You'd go in there, and I'd go in there with my customers, and how we drink our lunch. The I, the reason I had to tell you that it was a, the spirit was so high. It was a celebration of life, and I couldn't wait to get there and be a part of that energy. The energy would, honest to God, go into your body. Everybody had energy. What town am I talking about? Hmm? Yeah, some you and. She wins a free ride on the duck bus or something. Detroit. <laughs> Detroit. Think what's happened to that spirit. Um, I think I might have said this last night. One of the most interesting ones, I was in Memphis recently. Has anybody been there? Whoa, you talk about a spirit that's crashed. What the hell happened? Now remember, you drive up, get in your car and drive up the street and, you, and you're in Nashville. What about that one? Booming. Their spirit might be booming more than Austin. I get tired of hearing good things about Austin. But, <laughs> but think about that. Because Memphis and Nashville are in the same country. They're in the same state, so so much, but, but you see you get a beautiful kind of control, experimental, why wouldn't they have the same outcome? You know, they have kind of the same personality. If you're like twins separated at birth, they both have music backgrounds. You know, Memphis was blues and Nashville's kind of, there's no money in blues or there's no money in country western. But it's a great thing for spirit. But why would Memphis tank and Nashville explode? Well, they're different spirits. And you wonder where do spirits come from? Spirits come from you and me. And then how we do throughout those cities is accumulation, and that's how our country does. I wanted to, this is kind of a downer, but I want to do it with you any, any, anyway. <laughs> because, no, there's a narrative that I think is real hard, that's not good for leaders, leaders like you, but. Clock. Um, <clears throat> I was on a plane back, I think I was coming from Frankfurt, it doesn't matter. You know, they bring that cart by, and they got all those newspapers. So I got a Financial Times. International, Wall Street Journal, International, New York Times. You know how you kind of rip through them. And I read in the New York Times that America's in a recovery. Thought about that. <clears throat> and uh, Obama was still president. And I was thinking, well, it's the New York Times. And, you know, we live in an environment now where almost everything can be explained by politics, you know. So I think, well, of course, that's the New York Times propping that up, saying that, we are, that we're in a recovery. I didn't know if we're in a recovery or not. Then I take the Wall Street Journal, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, it said we're in a recovery too. So I thought, well, that's interesting. I thought, well, maybe they're just trying to prop the markets up. So they're going to say we're in a recovery. They're not going to, they don't want to see it any other way. I had an economist too. I looked at, I don't know which way the economist leads. I don't know what they're trying to do there. But anyway, they said we're in a recovery too. 
So I get back and I Google, <laughs> I Google the definition of recovery. I think I know what recovery means, but I just wanted to see. And it says that you're sick and then getting better. That was basically the thing. So we, we have a, I went to our top economist at Gallup and I said, are we in a recovery? And he just looks at me and he goes, no. I said, what do you mean no? I said, every place I go, the news and everywhere else, they keep telling me I'm in a recovery. That's the national narrative. And he goes, we're not. He doesn't have any, if, if anybody's apolitical, it's this guy. So I asked a few people, I called around and I said, who's the most respected economist in the world? I said, I need, I need that man or woman. And they said, it's unquestionably Angus Deaton. You ever heard of him? Yeah. So I said, Angus. So I, take, I live in Washington. Um, I've lived there a long time. But anyway, I take the train up to Princeton. I go over and see Angus. I know him just a little bit, but it was great to see him. And he got knighted, too, so he's, he's Sir Angus. Got the Nobel Prize, I think, about 12 months ago. And you know, Princeton has a whole bunch of super economists in there. I just wanted to ask him, <laughs> I wanted to ask him one question. So he said, and when he's particularly peaceful, I said to him, Angus, are we in a recovery? And he said, no, we're not. And he said, why do you ask? <laughs> I said, like he thought I would know. I said, because everything I read, see, and hear says we're in a recovery. And I said, well, what about all the economists in this building? I said, well, would they agree with you? And he said, every one of them. Okay, so I went back on my train and went back down to, down to Washington. But you know why it's important for leaders? Because if you think we're in a recovery, you make very different decisions than if you think we are grinding down. And <clears throat> I said, well, aren't we going along at about 2%? I don't know. I'm going to tell you something. Maybe everybody knows but me. I didn't know this. But he said to me, productivity has been going down for 20 years. I didn't know what productivity was. Do you? I didn't know what, I thought I knew what it was. I, I thought it meant that Jackie's working faster than I am. So she has more productivity. That's not what it is. It's almost like economists took a word to confuse me, the guy from Lincoln. <laughs> he won't know what productivity is. Let's use that. But so when economists, let's say left-leaning or right-leaning or whatever it is, are in Washington, when they sit down and argue, they have to all agree that they're going to go by one number. And they don't use GDP. They use GDP per capita. Because when you're going along at 1.7 or 2% for 10 years, you see, you have population coming in. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying, is this bored? Is this interesting? What they're trying to do, should I? Give me, give me a hand sign. That's, the new material's not good. Get out, get out of it, for God's sake. But what they're trying to figure out is what's the direct income of a country? So if we were a country, we would have, and you said, what's the sales of America, Inc.? It'd be about 18 trillion. We'd have about 20 trillion of debt. We'd have about 175 million employees, about 125 million full-time, 50 part-time, something like that. We were losing about half a trillion a year. But it, it's like we keep hiring, but our sales don't go up. And so what they should have called it was a, one that we do use, which is PPP, per person productivity. So what's been happening for 20 years, it was up at around 4% <clears throat> in each it just goes down, and so now we're at zero. But I've been real concerned about that number <clears throat> because it means as a, as a human race, we're not improving anymore. So it means something's very wrong. If you said, what does the America Inc. need as far as a regular GDP number? We break even at 2.5. It's really an important number. So as long as we're going along, so we just had two quarters of three, then we had the first quarter of zero or something. So maybe we'll end the year at about 2.3. It means we had a loser again. Uh, I'm gonna make one more point, then I'll get off this. I asked the best economist I know, when's the most productive time? 
Man and woman appeared about 200,000 years ago. I said, is there, and of course, we didn't have economists back then. <laughs> but, but I said, when's the most productive time in the history of humankind? And they agree. Even Angus isn't, isn't he's, he's British. But they said in the United States of America between 1850 and 1950. Just, I don't know. Things like that just, we sort of invented everything. Plumbing, electricity, flight. And, but the spirit of America was just booming. You know, the Wright brothers got flight, I think, in about 1903 or something like that. Hell, we were on the moon in 1969, but think of the force of that, of that spirit. What do you think GDP was during the biggest boom in the history of humankind, which was in America? Between, what do you think GDP was? Let me just guess. Ten billion. Uh, let's do percent. Close, huh? Three and three quarters. So if you said, what does America have to do where we blow the world away? When America dominates the world in economics, I don't mean to, make, I don't mean to sound too American. I, I think the world works better. When we lead with trade and we lead with partnerships and we do all that. But if you go on along at 1.7, you see what three and three quarters is? It's double productivity. It means that humans are doing twice as much. Okay, this, is, this gets a little more depressing, then I'll pick it up. <laughs> so I started looking for places, what it looks like to be when dynamism is in decline. What's a country look like? Well, here's one. If you take the, the number of publicly listed companies on NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange, 20 years ago, there was 8,000 of them. So I asked, what should it be now? And they said about 12,000. Where is it? Yeah, 3,700. Oh my gosh, it's gone in half. That whole thing's grinding down. But see what happens with companies when they can't get growth. I'm not pick, I, I love big business. They're my clients and everything else. But when they can't get growth, they give up. So when people aren't getting ideas and starting things and winning new customers and doing all that or breaking out of the company and starting a company of their own because there's a whole bunch of spirit, they don't have growth. And so to get growth, you know what they do? They just buy their competitor. Jack Welch was a great CEO, but, but he taught us that. Be number one or two in your market or get out of it. And you know how you do it? That's code talk for acquire your competitor. Cut jobs and then lower your prices. But that's what happens when you're in a non-recovering market. Well, then you go, well, we need to fix that. We need more publicly listed companies or we're not going to need Wall Street. So how do you do that? We get that with IPOs. I'm going to do that one. <laughs> so about 10 years ago, it was really a good year. We had 400 IPOs. So NAS, you know, I suppose it's just NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange fighting for them. 400, 200, 150. I don't think we're going to have 100 this year. Why doesn't anybody write this stuff down? We're not going to need NASDAQ or the New York Stock, Ex New York Stock Exchange. But that's what happens to a country that's actually has declining dy dynamism. Okay, this is very depressing. It's very fixable. If you take it down to the very number that creates the birth of energy, it's when firms start. And so <clears throat> that one over 30 years has gone just like this. So in the last, what, three, four years, now they've crossed. So now we have more firms dying <clears throat> than we have starting, which just, which just, doesn't, which just doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> I wrote these notes down here, now I can't really, I can't really read them. I, I'm concerned. That's why I write some of this stuff. I'm, not, I'm, I'm actually just a regular CEO of a mid-sized company, but I get <clears throat> so concerned that leaders are off on the wrong track. But what we've decided fixes 
startups because we don't have them. We've decided that it's innovation. Just, just let that sink in for a minute. Everybody has. So we have innovation centers and innovation buildings. And I heard John, God bless him, saying we need more innovation. I have one question for you. Where does it say innovation creates startups? The answer is nowhere. Because innovation itself doesn't have any value at all until a customer is standing next to it. Why the hell do we miss that? People in Washington today, they'll be there saying, I need, I need $10 billion for NASA or, or all of the labs. What for? Because we need innovation so we can have so we can have more startups. What if we're just wrong? What if all of America is going down the wrong track and we just keep putting in tens of billions and hundreds of billions of dollars into innovation and we don't have any startups at all? But you know what we've done? We're so good at it. We've got this giant institution of innovation. Uh, uh, picture it as like uh, uh, a hundred story tower. But then we've got this little cabin with smoke coming out as far as the science goes of startups. I wanted to give you an idea because I, I read John's notes there. But it would be really good if Denver was a famous city for spirit. Would you say, well, what should our spirit be? Have it be a spirit of builders. Here's what we do. We're so good at innovation. If I said, um, if, I don't know if the superintendent of schools is in here, but if I said, give me a list. You probably have about, it's a quick math, maybe, maybe 50,000 kids in high school or something like that. But if I said, line them up, smartest to dumbest. <laughs> and you know what the difference is. The ones at the top can read, recall, and reason better than the ones down at the bottom. And, and it's really cruel that that works. You give them all a book, these up here can read it faster, remember more, and reason from it fa faster than those kids. Then you know what we do with those kids? Teachers love them. Students don't necessarily. They're after the cheerleaders and the, quarterback, the point guard or some kind of a thing. But the teachers know them. And this is what we're so good at in America, because then they're on their way to the University of Chicago or Stanford and then MIT and, and to NASA or National Hospital Institute. Uh, Health Institute, we just kill it with that. And then they're, they do innovation. We love it. But you see, the magic would be is take those 50,000 kids and line them up. But see, we're born differently. Born differently. And universities don't believe that. They know it with, they know it with IQ, but what they don't know it is with grit. And we're also born differently with determination. We're also born differently with our relationship to risk. We're also born differently with our response to serious problems. Some people actually prefer to be in an environment where they've got to fix something. Here's one that's really important. You, it's hard to even find material to read about it. Some people are born where they absolutely cannot have a boss. Their, system, <clears throat> their systems don't fire. I could say, that makes some people laugh because they just, I guess I'm taught that they must be just like that. That is actually a gift. It's a sign of a gift that you were born to build something. So if I took some of those attributes and I said, now line those 50,000 kids up by their ability to build something, we can't do it. What universities do, God bless them all. <clears throat> is they say, we'll just train it. You say, well, wh whoever said you could train it? Tell me about the successes you've had. It's zero, 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 zero. None of them work. It's because, again, they've got the wrong, they've got the wrong premise. So you have, say 50,000, about, about half a percent of people, of kids, let's just say coming out of high school, have a gift where they can build something with really no limits. Isn't that amazing? We built some profiles. We can test them for 40 speed. You can test them for IQ. We can test how well they can play a guitar. But the one that we need most of all, we can't test and we can't predict. 
But as soon as we do that, then we can change the, change the world. But imagine if we knew where born builders were like we know where there's a, a, a born running back. Then that changes Denver, <clears throat> that changes Colorado, and then everybody wants to figure that out. But I wanted to give you that <clears throat> idea, and we're doing a little bit of that here. But it's not exploded anywhere in America, but if it exploded here in Denver, you could be an example for the whole country, and I think that'd make a big difference.